Welcome back, everybody. Uh, super excited to get rolling here with Ryan. I know that uh, um, we've been having some fun just chatting with each other, and so I want to move this right along. So a quick little intro uh, about Ryan and his background and that sort of thing, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, he was born in Southern California, I believe in Burbank, uh, where my uh, aunt and uncle and cousins lived for many years, and so I know it very well. Um, and he grew up uh, out in Southern California. So that's where he was, but then he decided to go to Yale University. Why? I don't know. I guess he's super smart, but he also wanted to freeze his ass off, and so that's why he chose Yale. Um, but anyway, he was there for a couple of years and um, majored in philosophy, so from what I understand, don't get too deep with him. He's a pretty smart guy, like I said. Um, played baseball, obviously, over there. He was uh, drafted by the, <clears throat> the team from Boston in the sixth round uh, back in 2008, I think it was, and was called up and played in 2011. He's been playing for 10 years now. He is, yes, a free agent. So if any of you work for uh, the front office in baseball, and once they get their shit together and uh, and this lockout and so forth, um, if you want to sign him, please do. Um, but otherwise, um, he's played for a long time. He's played on Team Israel in, uh, I think it was the 2017, um, um, what do you call it, uh, the WBC. Um, World Baseball Classic, and then also uh, in the Tokyo Olympics back in 2020. And he is in Denver now. I like the colorful background. I already said that. That's very mesmerizing. Um, but listen, thanks for being here. Appreciate your time. And uh, what I want to talk about today, and we're going to jump in in a second with this stuff, is that, um, you know, I, I think the general feeling amongst the, the public out there is that, wow, every Major League Baseball player has it made. They've got all the money in the world, all the trappings. They've got everything at their feet and at their disposal. They're doing great. And I think that the problem with that perception is that actually the vast majority of major leaguers, they have a fantastic career. They may make some money, but at the end of the day, they're not all walking around with massive endorsement deals. They're not all walking around with promises of fantastic careers once they leave baseball. And uh, I do want to talk about today how you're teeing yourself up for a fantastic second career, next career. And um, also really talking about the skill set that you can show companies and executives and, and people in the corporate world, how so many of the skills that you've developed as a major leaguer can be brought into the corporate setting. Does that sound good? Let's do it. All right, great. First of all, so you've now been playing for, for over a decade and you have been sent down, you've been traded, you've been released, injured, all kinds of things, as you say, 23 times. Um, tell me a little bit about, I mean, the first few times that it happened, how you reacted and how since that time you've really adapted. Yeah, so 23 times I've made my dream come true and been one of the best players in the world. And 23 times so far, I've been told you're not good enough anymore and you don't get to be on the team. The pay scale from the majors to the minors is, you know, less than a 10th. So you, we get paid on an everyday basis. You fly on private jets, you get police escorts to the airport in the major leagues. You stay in four-star hotels in a room by yourself. You go down to the minors, you're on a bus all night to get to stay in the Red Roof Inn, play in a stadium. It's a very different lifestyle. And if we're honest, the first few times that I got sent down, I didn't handle it very well. It, it was, you know, I wasn't good enough. My self-identity was wrapped up in my success as a baseball player. And I didn't understand how I could be good enough and one of the best in the world one day and then the next not be good enough. And since I've learned how to deal with that and understand that baseball can be a business and my self-identity is not tied to getting sent down, you know, I'm not the equivalent of a lowly employee in this big organization. Now I, I can handle it better. I bounce back faster. I end up playing better and seeing it as an opportunity to work on my game with less people. I, I found the positives. Well, and what's interesting is that every time that happens, you wonder, wait a minute, is there something I did wrong? Like what caused this to happen? Why did the team release me? And then as you said, the self-identity, we also start maybe overthinking and overanalyzing what's happened and what could you have done differently and so forth. Instead of maybe it was just simply a change in whether it's management style or a change in sort of what they wanted from somebody. And I think one of the most important things to do is to always try to look at things and it's not easy to do, but try to look at things from their perspective instead of your own. You mentioned earlier, 
you know, uh, with athletes, um, sometimes it's a quick lesson in, in what, what's a, what is a business and they're making business decisions, not because they don't like you as a person. It's, they're saying, well, look, we, we don't need Ryan's position or that skill set anymore. We need a different one. We're moving forward with something else. Yeah. And since I've learned how to deal with it and it's just a move, you know, the guy that is making $7 million that plays my position is going to play whether he's playing better than me or not, whether the coach likes him better or not. It's a business decision. Since I've been able to do that, I go back down to the minor leagues and play my best and earn my way back to that opportunity faster. And I see younger players that haven't dealt with it or don't know how to deal with it go and, you know, they've got their head up their bum and they're frustrated. They let their frustration come out and they end up sticking down in the minor leagues for longer and missing future opportunities or playing themselves out of the game entirely because of the way that they handle themselves when the chips are down. And that's the thing is that even though it's not a personal decision, sometimes they're taking in your personality as a factor. And, you know, there's uh, a lot to be said about leadership in the locker room. We're going to talk about that in a minute, because that's, that's a trait that absolutely translates into your post career. But, um, but while you're playing, I mean, I know that you mentioned to me that, that, that a few years back, the team asked you to switch positions. Tell me a little bit about what that was like. And because, you know, that that obviously happens in the corporate space as well, where we're often asked to change our responsibilities in a job. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so I played I played catcher most of my life uh, in high school. I actually had to change positions one time because we had someone in my grade that hit puberty before me and was just bigger, stronger and better. So I had to play outfield to even make the high school team. I got recruited to college as an outfielder and came back to catching. The same thing happened with the Red Sox in 2014. Christian Vasquez, who was still their catcher to this day, won a World Series for them, was coming up behind me as a young prospect, a hot, a hot shot. And the team said, if you want to play, if you want to help our team, we need you to play first base. And it was something that I had never done before. It was something that I was actually really afraid of because it, with the ground ball, if it comes up, I don't have a mask on. I was afraid for my teeth. And when the coach called me, I, I of course said, of course, of course, I'll do whatever I can to help the team. And I hung up and immediately called my agent. I was like, Hey, I don't want to do this. Get me out of it. But it ended up being a great opportunity for me to learn a new position, be able to pivot. And I ended up getting called up that year as a first baseman. Whereas if I was only catching, if I hadn't learned a new skill set, I would have missed the opportunity to play in the major leagues and, and help the organization. Well, that's the thing is that I think also in sort of this day and age, and it's, you see it especially the last, um, even the last year, and they talk about the great resignation. They talk about how it seems like employees are almost caring less about what their employers want. They're saying, well, look, if I don't get what I want, I'm out of here, right? But I think that all has a tendency to cycle through and it's gonna come back to the other way around. But I think what you're talking about is so critical in the, in the corporate space because again, if I'm a manager and I want you to do something else like switch from catcher to first, if you want to stay with the organization, you're going to try to do what you can. But um, I think some people are saying, well, screw that. I'm going to quit and go to another team. Well, it doesn't quite work that way in Major League Baseball. But tell me a little bit about um, the concept of, you know, in baseball, you're you're playing for a variety of managers in different styles. Tell me a little bit about what, what that is like and how do you sort of adapt and pivot as needed? I think you're absolutely right. Playing So playing for different managers, I've played for 10 different managers in the major leagues. Wow. Some of them I've loved, some of them I have not loved, and I have not been able to perform well for some of these managers. Also, um, kind of going back to the last point was yeah. where, it, where it relates to the, the real world workspace is a lot of people want to say the company has no loyalty to me. Why should I show loyalty to the company? And it's the same thing in baseball. If if we're treated like chess pieces on a board where we're moved around and cut, it would be easy to not want to show any loyalty to the team. But at this point, I'm 34 years old. And I know that when the, the Cleveland Indians signed me last year, they even said, before we called you, we called the last three teams you've played for and asked how you are in the clubhouse. We asked how you are with the oh, younger wow. players. How are you with the younger pitching? So I ended up getting a new opportunity to play baseball and continue chasing my dream because of the person I presented myself as in the clubhouse. I think that's the same with companies. We ask for letters of recommendation. We call former bosses. How is this person going to 
act if we hire them? Are they going to be an asset as a personality in our workforce? That's really important. Um, well, one of the, one of the things you talked to me about is 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 how you know, it's, and we've heard it before, but being authentic to who you are, right? And it's so essential, especially as an athlete and as you transition into the corporate space. Tell me a little bit about some of the sort of the, some of the leadership lessons that you've picked up and learned along the way that you feel can translate into into the business space. One of the things I've learned is that if I want to be a good leader for someone else, I first need to be who I am as a person. I can't lead the way that Jason Veritek led those Red Sox. He was the captain of the Red Sox for 15 years. My first couple of years on the Red Sox, I tried to live up to my vision of how he acted and people saw right through it. I was miserable and unhappy and, and I wasn't a leader. It, it was, it didn't come through as true. And some of the things that I've learned along the way is who, who am I and what is my leadership style and what do people need? Because different people need different things. One of the, some of the things I've learned in baseball, I've actually recently got with uh, Jackie, who is in the audience today. Jackie recently wrote a book and she's been teaching leadership lessons for 20 years to executives. And she's, she understands the science behind what makes good leaders great. And speaking with her and understanding the science behind what I've learned in baseball has really helped me um, kind of validate the things I know as far as when I meet a new coach or a new hitting coach, new manager, the first thing I do is say, this is what I need to make me my best. And I can, and if you can help me with this, I'm going to be the best player for you and we're going to win the game. That's perfect. So, um, so look, and a lot of that has to do with really building that, that connection with someone to trust, right? If, if it's, you know, it's funny, I, um, I don't know if I should say this, that I'll just say there was a certain Olympian uh, that I've been watching a lot of Winter Olympics and there was an Olympian that I thought she just seemed so kind of fake, like there was just lacked genuine whatever it was. And it was, it seemed really evident, but it also seemed evident to the other performers where they were kind of like, eh, uh, you know, when, when they were going to hug her and stuff like that, whatever it was. And I think Mark, can I tell you a can I tell you yeah. a funny story that kind of, of exemplifies this point? Yeah. So in the Red Sox, the year was the year was 2012, <laughs> I think, or maybe 2013, whatever it was. The yeah. Red Sox hired a new hitting coach, Chili Davis. If any of you out there know don't know who Chili Davis is, he has the second most home runs of a switch hitter of all time in the major leagues. He was yeah. a really talented player himself. He came to be a hit a hitting coach for the first time. I've never met him before in my life. I'm coming off two seasons in a row of being offensive player of the year in the minor leagues. So I, I basically, I know what I'm doing at this point. Right. And on my first day of spring training, Chili goes, Hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you, I don't even remember what the tip was. And I said, Chili, with all due respect, will you watch me hit before you try to change me? And I thought, you know, I was just standing up for myself, but what I've learned since then was that I was telling him how I needed to be coached and how I was going to be my best. And later that day, the manager came up to me and he said, Chili Davis came up to me and said that you, in a very nice way, told him to shut up. And I, but I think it, he meant it in a positive way of I was asking for what I needed and I was helping him coach me as, as he was the leader and I was kind of telling him what I needed. So, um, but that's, it's interesting because, you know, um, I think sometimes that whole approach is is um, is critical. Again, in the corporate environment, baseball, and anything where you know you need to understand the dynamic between who you are and sort of on the on the totem pole or whatever it might be, and and uh, and those that are higher than you. But but if it's done in the right way, and you build that connection and that trust with that person up here, then it's a different story where you can really thrive in that environment versus being. Um, sort of confrontational, I guess, even though you weren't, it was sort of seen that way a little bit, right? So I, I guess it's the, you probably both should have had a beer first or something. I don't know. Well, I think it comes down to a lot of people have heard of the golden rule, treat other people how you would want to be treated. Right. But yeah. A lot of people haven't heard of the platinum rule, which is treat other people how they want to be treated. And it makes so much sense. But if you don't frame it in that way, then people don't understand that not everyone wants to be treated the same way that you do. And not everyone needs the same things that you do. Now that's platinum right there. It's going to say that's leadership. gold, but that's platinum. Very nicely done. Now, how do you, 
you know, you, you also mentioned to me before about the concept of, you know, finding your, your own spark, and that's what's going to spark brilliance in others. Tell me a little bit about that. So I, again, I wanted to be Jason Veritek, the captain of the Red Sox. I thought I needed to be him. And what I saw in him was a stoic leader who didn't show emotion, who led by example, but that's not me. I'm the type of person that loves playing baseball. I play with my heart on my sleeve. I like to have fun. And when I watch the highlight of my first two major league home runs, I don't even allow myself to smile as I cross the base paths. It's, it's almost makes me sad looking back on it. In 2017, it almost took my career ending when no one wanted to sign me. I had been sent back to double A the year before where I finally said, screw it. I'm going to have fun and I'm going to go out there and just play like I'm five years old again and love doing what I do. And I started going out to the field early and playing catch with fans. There was 15 kids in the stands that would come to every game and they'd be waiting for me because they knew I was going to come play catch with them. And you see the, the pride beaming in their parents' faces. as they film you know, us playing catch before the game. And then what happened was I played the best baseball I had played in, in years because I, I finally let myself be who I wanted to be and enjoy what I was doing. It made me a better baseball player also. Well, and so, um, you know, it's interesting because one of the things I like to talk about, when you mentioned a second ago about that whole thing, um, thing where the parents were beaming and the, and the kids were thrilled and all that sort of thing. Um, it translates really well into anything. A lot of times we don't realize the impact we're having on others. And sometimes we almost ignore it a little bit. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quick story. Uh, many, many years ago, I had a chance to meet, um, I was at a, at a, at a baseball sort of a event, a card show kind of a thing. And this is, you know, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago. And I met one of the guys that I met was Brooks Robinson and, you know, Hall of Fame third baseman, Baltimore Orioles, and really an icon and just nice as kind of planet. But I'll, I'll never forget, like handing him the baseball to sign. And he grabs the ball and he, he looks at me and says, Mark, he looks up and he says, you know, tell me, you know, what do you do? And I just like graduated college and just started a job. And I was like, I did one of those like, wait, what? And he says, you know, tell me more about what you do. And I said, oh, well, time I'm an executive recruiter and I help you know people find jobs at banks and so forth and he goes oh that's really interesting and he started talking to me about my job and I did one of those things where I can't believe he actually gives a crap about what I do he's Brooks Robinson Hall of Fame third baseman right and as you can tell I've met since then hundreds and hundreds of athletes and so forth and that still sticks with me because he made that impact and he just said one thing it didn't take him didn't cost him any energy or anything and I'm saying that's that's the same impact you're having, Ryan, on, on those kids and, their, and the parents is that they will forever be able to tell someone, I played catch with a major leaguer. To you, it's just throwing a ball back and forth with, between a couple of kids. The same thing translates into a professional um, world where a lot of times the things we do and say, we don't necessarily know the impact they'll have, but we should try to pay attention to that, right? Yeah. Uh, Jordan in the, in the chat mentioned the flow state about how you end up being a better player when you're in the flow. And another way that I've found another tool that I kind of found accidentally that works for me that I then learned the science behind that later through uh, Jackie was humor. When I'm nervous before a game and I'm about to play in front of 40,000 people and I'm, I've got the butterflies, right? I'll put my headphones on and listen to stand-up comedy. And all of a sudden, if I'm just laughing and, and repeating the funniest jokes I heard from the day in my head, I ended up having the best game of my career in my debut with the Cincinnati Reds because I had been listening to comedy all day. Nicely done. Um, almost reminds me of the, uh, the Seinfeld episodes when they tied in with the Yankees and so forth. Yeah. I'll, I'll still to this day, I'll never forget, you know, um, George Costanza giving Derek Jeter hitting tips and Jeter says, um, George, we won the World Series. And George says, yeah, in six games. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was brilliant. Anyways, now um, in terms of, you know, we've talked about some of your successes and you were the you know best best hitter for, in a couple, for over a couple of years and that sort of thing. But how do you take some of the failures um, or some of the things where you didn't succeed as well as you'd hoped? How do you turn those into opportunity? That's a great question. And 
it's easy to talk about the failures and I had a hard time or it's easy to talk about the successes. Right. And for the longest time, I had a harder time speaking about my failures until I realized that the failures helped me grow and that they were always a learning opportunity and it always opened another door for me. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm not proud of at all, but that I can I can share because it's public record, I guess, is I tied a negative major league record catching knuckleballs. I allowed the most balls to get by me in one inning that had ever happened before. I barely remember it. It was August 2nd. It was a Tuesday, 2013 in Houston. The roof was closed. I don't remember anything about it. Um, just kidding. Guessing Tim Wakefield? Uh, it was uh, Stephen Wright, actually. Oh, Wakefield, right. Um, successor. But every time something like that happens, it gives me the opportunity to grow. And what I do is I, I go back to what I'm really good at. Say anytime I go into a slump for baseball, I try to minimize what I'm doing. I try to take all the excess out. I don't try to hit home runs. I don't try to pull the ball. I go back to what makes me, me, and what is the minimum I can do to get the best result. Less effort, get in my comfort zone, swing at strikes. And I think the same thing can translate into the business world also. If you're trying to make too many products or if you're trying to sell to too many different people and all of a sudden the company is is going astray, what is it that you do really, really well and go back to that? That's a perfect lesson. And, you know, the um, there are so many different as we've already gone through so many different comparisons between, uh, you know, a career in a professional sport and and a career in in a profession any profession and uh you know you've done a great job already of highlighting many of those tell me a little bit about um your perception of what some of the things are that athletes have that they can bring into a corporate setting and be successful um i think first of all athletes especially athletes that play team sports know how to work on a team mm -hmm. um i have had more failure than anyone else i know at other than the record I mentioned, I looked it up the other day. I've struck out 908 times in my career. And I hope I get to strike out 900 more because that means that I had the opportunity to keep playing. Right. Um, I've also learned how to win with grace because understanding how to win and stay hungry and go out and chase the next victory, I think, is also a skill. Um, I've I've traveled around. I've, I've done the grind and I've worked for tons of different hitting coaches, managers and different styles. I've had to learn what makes me good and how to speak up for myself and tell them what I need to make me be my best. One thing that sometimes I find that athletes take for granted and they shouldn't is, is the comfort level in front of a camera, comfort level in front of a crowd, in front of an audience. You mentioned the butterflies, but everybody gets those when they're in front of a big crowd. But the fact remains that you've been able to perform at a very top, you know, top level in front of a large audience and so companies would love to hire athletes be just because of that reason the fact that you're already comfortable doing that if i said to you ryan i need you to call you know nancy smith or or bob jones or whatever it is uh, they're the ceo manager director or whatever it is you're not going to be nervous you're going to grab a phone and just do it because you know that if i'm asking you to do it and you know there's probably the likelihood that there's a positive result on the other side of it you'll do it most people are terrified of that. Most people are terrified of speaking on a stage in front of a camera, et cetera. So that's something that I think uh, sometimes is downplayed, but it shouldn't be because you've already got that down. I'm assuming. You yeah, well, and, and later in my career, what I've realized is early in my career, when I had those nerves and the butterflies, maybe it affected my game and I tried to do extra. I tried to overperform uh -huh. and outpace what I was really good at. And like I said earlier, what I've learned to do now is kind of bring it in. What am I really good at and how can I just do that? And in the last five years, I've had my best games when the lights are the brightest and the pressure is the highest. Nice. Well, uh, that's another key thing is to be able to compartmentalize, right? To be able to separate. And uh, that's that's a big thing. And look, you know, uh, at the end of the day, I think that um, there are uh there's so many different um other like look when an athlete has like for example let me take a step back you're behind the plate we talked about this the other day you're behind the plate and you're pivoting almost every second you are sort of adapting as the game goes forward it's the same thing in a corporate environment where this is not going to be cut and dry cut and dry 
as during the course of a day, if certain things are happening, you need to be able to adapt. But tell me a little bit about um, when you're calling the game behind the plate, you know, what are some of the things that you try to factor in? That's a great question. So every, every game before the game, the starting pitcher, the starting catcher, and the pitching coach get together and go over a scouting report. And these scouting reports have every detail of how the hitter reacts to fastballs over 94 miles per hour, under 94, how they react to sliders, change-ups, curveballs with certain spin rates in the zone, out of the zone. And we go in with a plan for every single hitter, whether we want to throw fastballs away, sliders. And then we go out in the game, and I call it playing with my eyes, right? If we could just plug and play, it would be a video game. If we could just say, we're going to throw fastballs away to this guy, we're going to throw sliders to this guy. But it doesn't always work that way because the pitcher is a human being that has a different repertoire on any given day. Something is working. Something else is not working. One of the hitters made an adjustment. Somebody else didn't. So we need to be able to adjust back and on the fly what's working today and how do we go and be successful today. That's perfect. That's really great. Uh, Ryan, we got a question from uh, someone named Anonymous. Um, you seem to be grateful for everything, the process and so forth. Have you always had that in you or have you learned it along the way? And if so, what made it click for you? Um, I definitely rode the highs and lows for the first few years and it was really difficult. And I even in AAA one time, 10, 11 years ago, when the catcher ahead of me was playing poorly and I thought I was being held back, I, I made an off the cuff comment about like, I wish he would just stub a toe and I would get the opportunity and even just the the wishing ill on him, even in a little, it ended up eating me on the inside. And it wasn't until one of my coaches who just got hired for the Padres as the bench coach, he kind of showed me it was the master key system. I don't know if anyone's come, uh, heard of this, the secret, the concept of, you know, if you wish ill on anyone else, you're also wishing ill on yourself. And if you wish positive for everyone else, you're also wishing positive for yourself, because in some ways we're all connected. And it was kind of a self-revolution where I had to grow up and understand that if I wished, again, if I wasn't rooting for everyone else, then I was rooting against myself also. That's perfect. I mean, you know, we all hear the term karma and what comes around, goes around, that sort of thing. And, and I think many people are big believers in it, but a lot of times they're big believers on the negative side of things. But it's also positive, too. If you're putting positive will out there and positive, uh, you know, you're doing good deeds and so forth. It will come back into it. You know, I tell people like I continue to deposit, uh, make deposits into the karma bank with the idea that I may need to make withdrawals at some point. So it's uh, that's really great. So uh, we have another question uh, from Dahlia. As a catcher, you have the unique perspective of seeing the whole field during every play, every pitch. How do you um, how do you apply that vision and ability to see the bigger picture uh, to the you know outside of baseball? The biggest thing that I've learned in baseball is say there's a, a cutoff coming to home and I need to decide to cut it to second or relay it into home plate. Mm -hmm. I The biggest thing is that I need to make a decision. Whether it's necessarily the right decision in that fraction of a second is less important than the fact that I make a decision. And I found in real life also, the more that you kind of weeble wobble over something and you, and you get stuck in paralysis by analysis, it's better to make a decision with the information you have today, make the best decision you can and live with it and go from there. And then when the next opportunity comes up, make a decision again, because not making a decision is always worse. Bingo. You know, it's funny, a lot of times people sort of live their lives or live sort of in that way where they, they're so terrified of the worst thing that can happen that they don't do anything, as you said. And at the end of the day, a lot of times the worst thing that could happen is really not that bad. <laughs> Right. Um, and the worst thing that can happen is not doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, well, look, this has been absolutely fantastic. I really, I truly appreciate your time. Uh, the chat box is going nutty, but what, we have one more. It looks like we have one more question from Susan. You mentioned that you listen to comedy before games. Can you share any um, morning and or nightly routine rituals that you do to maintain your positive mindset? Ooh, Susan, good. Um, I actually took a free online class during COVID when everyone's happiness was out the window, right? Everyone was stressed about the world. Yeah. It was called the science of happiness. And I learned schools through that or skills through that class that I still 
employ to this day that there's there's like five actions that you could take proactively that scientifically make you happier proven. Um, the ones that I do every day are I, I write down three things that I'm grateful for every day. And I try not to repeat at, for at least two weeks. I try to find a new thing every day. And that that trains my mind to hunt for the positive. Um, I try to speak to someone that I enjoy spending time with every day. I try to meditate. Um, even if it's just 10 minutes, even if you're not good at it, just trying to clear your mind for 10 minutes, um, exercise and perspective, making sure that you understand that if, if you're in the nitty gritty and things are hard, step back. Your life is not that bad. Nice. I like that. So look, um, one of the things that, one of the big reasons why I wanted you to come on board here today, Ryan, was to really show people that, um, you know, sometimes people seem to think that athletes, well, what do they know about the corporate world or the rest of the thing? Because a lot of times athletes will say, well, gee, you know, I've been playing for 10 years. My friend has been working for 10 years. He or she is now 10 years ahead of me. And what I try to say is, look, they're not that far ahead of you. Maybe they're a year or two ahead of you, but you bring such a valuable experience to the table. Um, you know, tell me a little bit about how people can reach, reach out to you if they want to bring you into, look, I think you'd be a fantastic speaker to any sort of corporate event where they want to maybe uh, teach some of the management, um, you know, a little bit about resiliency, grit, tenacity, and and how you can overcome 23, cut, you know, uh, being cut and sent down and so forth. But tell me a little bit, what's the best way to reach out to you and so forth? I'm always available on social media. Um, my Instagram is just rlavarnway. My Twitter is Ryan Lavarnway. I actually run my own accounts. I respond to everyone. Um, I've had six speaking engagements in the last 10 days, and four of them reached out to me on Instagram. Um, oh, nice. you, could also e you could also email me. My email is ryan.lavarnway at gmail. It's pretty, pretty simple. If you guys are up for poker analogies, I always like to see the flop. So I always like to, to see all the opportunities and then decide what's right for me and, and what kind of value I can provide to other people. So I love meeting new people. I love pursuing new opportunities. And um, I'd love to, to speak to you or to anyone that you think could benefit from, from me or that I could benefit from them. That's fantastic. Ryan, I truly appreciate your time today. We're going to bounce uh, back to the tables for some more conversation. Uh, hopefully you're going to hang out for a little bit. I like how you really put a lot of thought into your answers and you really um, can articulate a lot of what uh, what is happening and translating it from the world as a professional athlete into the corporate space. So um, thanks again for being on board here and uh, we'll do some more chatting with you guys. Thanks, Mark. All right, appreciate it.